Good morning to uh, ThinkTech Hawaii. This is uh, Alia Mashkas and Martin Despang's show Urban Transcendence. Uh, welcome uh, on a beautiful Saturday morning here uh, when you guys will watch it. Of course, it's a Thursday as our show is always on Thursdays from 1 to 2. But this morning here we are once again uh, broadcasting from uh, uh, Martin Despang as the host. We're still in beautiful, even more visible this morning dressed in Germany and uh, whereas last show showed you that uh, Dresden or more specifically Radebeul uh, which is a little town uh, very close to Dresden is a place that's very desirable even to live we've been with Brian Curling who's an American artist who is in residence here in Radebeul at the Weinhaus Aus uh, but today is a very special day because many people from around the world come to Radebeul today and actually yesterday started and it goes till till Sunday and this is related to uh, someone that uh, Rada Boyle is related to in history and our uh, special guest today is the uh, director emeritus of a museum related to that person so uh, Rene Wagner is our guest today thank you very much for being with us hello Pre appreciate it and this is the first time also as a proof for extended authenticity because René, although uh, I have witnessed him that he's pretty fluent in English, but he says due to the professional scope of think tech, he would prefer to have me translate it, which I'm very happy to do. So René, thank you for uh, 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 spending your time with us on a, on a Saturday morning. A parallel, there's the festival going on that we're going to talk about. But first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are, and then tell us about that person that sort of, um, you know, is the connection to Radebeul and what you've been doing for uh, many decades. Also, uh, erzähl uns ein bisschen über, über, über dich selbst und über Radebeul und natürlich über äh, den Herren, dessen Namen wir jetzt nennen werden. <lacht> ja, also äh, herzlich willkommen hier in Radebeul. Radebeul ist in Deutschland äh, sehr bekannt durch einen Schriftsteller namens Karl May, der im 19. Jahrhundert sehr äh, das Amerika-Bild der Deutschen geprägt hat. Nicht nur Amerika-Bild, auch das Orient-Bild, aber wir reden ja jetzt mal von Amerika, weil äh, zu diesen Tagen, diesen, kam, die Festtage an, äh, für diesen Mann, Karl May-Festtage, äh, immer im Mittelpunkt stehen äh, Indianer, die aus den Staaten rüberkommen mhm. und die einen Einblick in ihr, in ihr kulturelles Leben geben. Mhm. So René says that Radebeul is very well known around the world for uh, a gentleman uh, whose name is Karl May and Karl May was born in the, uh, or, or lived in the 19th century. I think he was born in 1842 or something like that. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And so uh, he was he, he wrote novels and these novels were actually published all around the world. I did a little bit of my homework and I read that his, uh, I think the, 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 the print scope had uh, 200 million uh, prints of, of his work all around the world. And uh, through his novels, uh, basically, uh, he kind of connected to the people he, he, he was writing about and he was writing about his novels about uh, Indians slash Native Americans, we'll get to that differentiation of the terminology kind of later a little bit. So he was envisioning uh, being in America, although he hadn't been at that time, and wrote these novels that fascinated generations of people around the world. He wasn't only writing about America, he was also writing about the Orient. So oriental uh, scenery was also his, his kind of background. And, and every year uh, at the end of May is the annual Karl May Festival. So it's, it's going on right now and actually draws um, many uh, tribal representatives and tribal leaders from America. And I once heard that these days it's where one of the largest accumulations of Native Americans in the world happen at one spot. And this is right above where we are right now. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. So you have been the director actually for almost 30 years and just you know, passed it on to the, to the next generation. 
What got you excited about uh, Karl May? So how's your very personal access to Karl May? Also, um, was war dein Zugang ganz persönlich an Natur zu Karl May für so viele Jahrzehnte? Also ich habe sehr gerne gelesen, schon als kleines Kind. Und äh, Karl May als der meist verlegteste deutschsprachige Schriftsteller kam dann irgendwann auch in meine Hände und ich habe ihn faszinierend gefunden. Und äh, ich habe mich dann mit der Kultur der Indianer beschäftigt. Ich war in, ein, in einer Vereinigung, in einem Club, wo äh, man die Kultur nachlebte, sich mit der Kultur intensiv beschäftigte. Ja, und so war dann der Schritt im Erwachsenenalter nicht, nicht ungewöhnlich, dass ich angesprochen worden bin, ob ich nicht dann dieses Museum leiten könnte. Mhm. Und das habe ich 29 Jahre getan. Mm -hmm. So René, like many children, uh, like to read. Well, that is certainly true for that generation, because today things are a little different. We will get to that. Yes, However, yes. Karl May, through the new media, made it to be transitioned, uh, transcended, which is the, the show's topic into the modern ages. But way back, uh, you, you like to read. And you also were interested in other cultures. So Karl May happened to be the most published German author at that time in, uh, with, in this kind of popular media that he was uh, practicing. So you got excited about that and then through that sort of developed expertise and, and excellence. And this is actually great talking excellence. This is really unplugged here <laughs> in the background. We're going to explain to you guys what that sound is a little yeah. bit later. So René uh, got into that and, and established experience and excellence and was actually then asked uh, to, uh, to run, to head, to direct the museum and he has been doing that for 29 years. So um, we talked a little bit about cultures. Um, so um, when, when you were young um, and then uh, later on, uh, this country here was, after the, the war was lost, uh, Germany got split up. And this particular part was under uh, Russian leadership, so to speak. So the Karl May Museum had to be, uh, had to be run under, under GDR circumstances. Uh, and just like Karl May, I think I mentioned that before, he actually, it's whenever, hopefully the audience, we get them so excited so they will read Karl May. And for me, when I did it, you know, when I was a kid, um, I was fascinated how real everything seemed. And certainly, you know, for, you know, in his realm, it was, it was real anyways. But also then both of us having had the chance to be in the U.S., you know, years later. And in fact, the last time we met was actually in Tucson, Arizona. Maybe we should talk a little bit about that later on. But Karl May, in fact, actually had never been where he envisioned the stories until the very end of his life, if I'm not mistaken. And, and even at that time, he really hasn't been in the part that we probably consider to be the most uh, stereotypically w uh, Wild West, Midwest or Southwest. He was actually more towards Niagara Falls, if I'm not mistaken, right? So how, um, the, the question will be uh, to you, how, um, how was the life Uh, of you as a director under under GDR uh, circumstances with obviously because it was related to America and American history probably the regime wasn't quite so enthusiastic and supportive of 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 the of the topic in the museum also die die Frage ist wie eben dann unter der DDR Gegebenheiten wie ist es dir gelungen sozusagen die Tradition fortzuführen um, obwohl natürlich dies sozusagen die Regierung wahrscheinlich nicht so begeistert war, weil es um Amerika ging. Also die, es wird für die amerikanischen Zuschauer vielleicht ein bisschen ungewöhnlich sein, aber äh, dieses Museum, was in DDR-Zeit ein Jahrmuseum hieß, mhm. Karl May war den Herrschenden etwas suspekt wegen seiner äh, Schreibweise, die das Christentum stark betonte mhm. und man wollte ja in der DDR nur nicht unbedingt Christen erziehen, sondern eigentlich Kommunisten erziehen. Mhm. Aber dieses Museum äh, hat unter dem Stichwort Völkerverständige, mhm. da legte man Wert darauf und da hat man auch wenig gestört. Also man äh, musste äh, sagen wir, sich an bestimmte Regeln halten, also die amerikanische Flagge durfte man zum Beispiel nicht zeigen. Mhm. Und äh, es ist auch so, dass 
die amerikanische Lebensweise mhm. nur nicht unbedingt dann äh, gefördert wurde. Ja, Sondern ja. es ging dann immer punktuell um die Indianer, um die Kultur. Mhm. Okay, so René, you confirm that under the socialist regime there wasn't necessarily excitement from the leadership because Karl May's uh, ideology or his philosophy was pretty much based on Christianity and the GDR was more about communism and socialism, so they weren't basically uh, compatible. But the reason why the GDR was at least tolerant uh, towards your leadership of the museum because it was about communication between cultures. So it was really about that they were aware that they had to somehow relate and connect. They didn't want to totally isolate themselves, which they did already enough, but they basically uh, were, were supporting uh, or at least tolerating the museum and the leadership and the message that you guys were, were communicating. And, and that's that's a good thing. They they didn't want to, for obvious reasons, support American lifestyle. That would have gotten the people too excited, and they wanted to have more of that. But as far as under the kind of the umbrella or the the window of history, they allowed uh, sort of intercultural communication. So that's very interesting. Um, and now I'm going to uh, uh, describe to you guys what the background noise was. Uh, the ones that we cut out were Harley Davidson's, so this is the modern American sound. Uh, there's a phenomenon here, uh, there's a little uh, train which we call the Lösnitz Duckel. And what is Duckel actually? I don't even know the, the English. It's a little German dog. Uh, audience, please excuse us, you got to look that up in the dictionary. But this is a, this is a train, it's a little steam train that runs on a narrow track and uh, that's actually a historical train that has been around and uh, coming back to GDR one of the probably retrospectively more good things about GDR is that they they were holding on to a lot of things that in the West we just threw overboard here because there wasn't any alternative they basically kept it and so the steam train basically made it uh, over the GDR days and then after the reunification it was kept for more nostalgic reasons so now it's a really integral part of the festival. And for me, who has lived in Tucson, Arizona, so very close to where most Europeans and people from the world go to see the most, what they consider the most stereotypical of Wild West. This area here, uh, uh, sort of surprisingly, or maybe for a good reason, has some kind of an analogy or some kind of feel. It's got some kind of, something is here. So the train is obviously, so the train is, a, is an integral part of of the, the perception of, 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 of America and its pioneering days. And it's a real steam train, so it makes a lot of, pollutes a lot, you know, and it makes a lot of noise, but it's tradition and people love it. It's just part of this. And then the train actually goes into a valley and that's the Lösnitzgrund. And the Lösnitzgrund has some pretty um, sort of, on a micro scale, so people don't get the wrong impression, everything in a bonsai version but it is it is you could imagine you know that that indians and cowboys come around the corner and in fact these days they do uh, i have my little nephew uh julian who is age five visiting and this is one of the major events in the year he's all dressed up uh, he actually bought his attire in hawaii talking globalism in a cowboy store so he's all dressed up and and he goes and he basically emerges into the culture we in fact met last night in a saloon and you're a familiar person to him so it's really interesting and exciting to see that tradition sort of being carried on and continued although times are significantly different because i imagine when you were a kid when you were talking about books were not the only thing but but a pretty primary way of of educating yourself and also edutaining yourself so this kind of modern word of edu edutainment i remember my dad as well he was uh reading the call my books under the blanket and having his little flashlight with him so mom doesn't doesn't get it you know so so that was really the excitement is kind of really carrying on so what is your what is your feeling that after so many years obviously through your great leadership and guidance that people are still interested in Karl May also wo kommt dieses ungebrochene Interesse an, an Karl May und seiner Erzählkunst her? Das also man, man muss sich erstmal vergegenwärtigen, als Karl May diese Romane veröffentlichte. 
äh, war die Reisetätigkeit der Menschen noch nicht so, der Tourismus noch nicht so ausgeprägt mhm. heute. Das heißt also, man hat sich in ferner Länder geträumt, unabhängig ob in der Literatur die Wahrheit geschrieben mhm. worden ist. Sondern sie war spannend, es war interessant, es geht um Freundschaften, es geht um andere Werte wie Treue und Tapferkeit. Mhm. Und das ist zum Beispiel eines, eines dieser Aspekte, die eigentlich zeitübergreifend sind. Mhm. Das ist das eine. Das andere, hier in der DDR war es dann auch so, dass die Musik, also die Country-Musik, mhm. die hat, äh, auch hier gab es Country-Festivals in der DDR. Das ist auch ein bisschen erstaunlich, aber diese Musik hat natürlich, äh, da, da dachte man an Pete Seeger, an Wally Gasway, hoffentlich spreche ich richtig aus, und äh, John B. ist. Ja, und das hat fasziniert. Und man hat sich eigentlich auch in diese Freiheit geträumt, in diese Weite des Landes. Auch wenn man das nicht kannte mhm. und keine Chance hatte, mhm. das kennenzulernen. Mhm. Das ist uns ja erst nach 1990 verkennt gewesen. Mhm. Aber dieser Traum davon, mhm. auch wenn er Hollywood gefärbt ist, mhm. äh, der ist mhm. da. Und das Ergebnis sieht man. 23 Jahre ist dieses Fest und kein Jahr unter 25.000 Besucher mhm. in den Tagen mhm. und das ist schon eine Menge mhm. und mhm. dieses Museum hat in diesen 80 Jahren, mehr als 80 Jahren, über 8 Millionen Besucher gehabt, das ist ein kleines Museum wow, wow. und das ist viel mhm. Mhm. und immer ging man natürlich nach Hause mit neuen Erkenntnissen über die Völker, die Indianer, mhm. die Völker, mhm. ja, allerdings auch mit romantischen Input. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So René recalls that back in the days of Kalmai, uh, the people were very limited as far as their physical way of traveling. They were pretty much rooted in their place where they were, unless they were privileged, but few people were. So people were basically sort of acting more or less locally in their realm, in their immediate realm. So these books were a vehicle and a means to basically reach out and travel in their imagination, pretty much. And this is what, what Karl May did in a beautiful way, that he took the people from where they were and brought them into another realm. And there are scientists, by the way, who uh, assign Karl May really, really wonderful uh, writing skills. Uh, and his, although his work is sometimes dismissed as romantic, or discriminated as kitsch or being romantic yeah. but at this point uh, there is an agreement amongst many uh, you know writing scientists that his work is really of, of the highest caliber the way he wrote because he captured the people's imagination so th so that's a that's an aspect that's certainly true and then maybe even more Rene says that under the restrictions of the GDR which was once again in times where people in the West were able to travel But again, for the other reason, for a political reason, people were restricted. Uh, that probably helped, um, you know, Karl May's popularity to carry on in basically being, uh, being once again the one who, who was kind of freeing the people and helping the people to, to, to live, live certain dreams. Uh, country music, uh, Rene said, which is surprising. Our co-host Ali Amashta is born in Texas and likes country music. I hope, Ali, you don't mind sharing that. So, uh, so country music is, is another means. So there was the writing and there was the music. So that people obviously were able to, uh, to know about the country music stars. And they just, you know, music was another vehicle. John Bates, you were, you were mentioning another country artist. That basically really, really helped to keep this keep the stream alive. Some numbers uh, you help me if I remember them correctly. You said the museum, and it's a very small museum. At a, 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 our a co-producer um, Lutz is is showing you the building, and so it's a very small museum. It's a little villa. Uh, by the way, our Despeng Architect and headquarters is only a few villas away, so we're neighbors That's to the cool. museum, right. and my parents have been friends with you for many years now, ever since they moved here permanently, so there's another friendship coming out of that. And this is what Rene was saying, that um, basically it's these values, these sort of eternal values of loyalty, of friendship. And this is why Karl May, after all, he was sort of a humanist that believed in the good of the people and that people that come from different backgrounds, different cultures, can work together if they want. 
And so this is sort of what makes the essence of, of these stories. So the numbers were that you said the museum exists, as, uh, it's been around for 80 years, and it had 8 million visitors, was that the yeah. number? Yeah. That's, that's very impressive, yeah. And, you know, and, and largely, you know, you're a very humble and understated person, but largely <laughs> credited to your great leadership over 20, 29 years. So that's, that's pretty amazing. Thank you very much for that. So um, I just ran the other day, I ran into um, uh, some people again, normal people uh, around in the neighborhood, in fact, and they said, well, you know, back in the days, people start to romanticize. They said, you know, under GDR days, you know, the museum was a little bit more authentic. We could, we could, we could touch everything. Whereas today, maybe because of popularity, probably insurance, I don't know, this is part of the question. Things have to be more protected, to be more managed. What is your feeling when you kind of look back uh, to the pioneering days of your, of your leadership and how things evolved, how they progressed, maybe certain things improved, certain things maybe were tougher. Also so uh, rückblickend betrachtet aus den Pionierzeiten deiner Museumsführung. Äh, äh, die eine Nachbarin hier, die sagte neulich, dass sie sagte, mich ja früher zu DDR-Zeiten, wo ja viele das verromantisieren, wiederum auch die DDR verromantisieren, sagte, da war das alles noch so ein bisschen, da haben wir da in dem Pavillon gesessen, wie hieß er nochmal, der, der Urvater hier ja, mit? Der, ja, der Patti Funk saß in dem Pavillon und hat dann vorgelesen und sowas. Und wie hat sich das sozusagen auch zwangsläufig und notdürftig entwickelt, die Dinge? Was sind da so die, so die Meilensteine gewesen und die Gründe dahinter? Als das Museum am 1. Dezember 1928 gegründet wurde, mhm. war das eine Sensation in der Presse. Mhm. Äh, Wild West Blockhaus in Radewall. Mhm. Und in der Tat äh, nicht so sehr die bauliche Hülle, die äh, ein die deutsche Romantik widerspiegelt. Mhm. Solche Blockhäuser hat es im Wilden Westen mit Sicherheit nicht gegeben. Mhm. Denn die waren ein Überlebenskampf. Das wird manchmal vernachlässigt. Man mhm. träumt dann mhm. ja, am Kamin äh, über äh, romantische Stunden am, am Lagerfeuer mit Gitarre oder so etwas. Das gab es sicher auch, aber das war nicht der Lebensinhalt der, mhm. der Menschen, die damals äh, den Wilden Westen gewissermaßen eroberten. Ja, damals, äh, aber diese Gegenstände, die hier sind, die sind exzellent. Die sind aus dem 19. Jahrhundert mhm. und äh, sie haben einen enormen äh, kulturhistorischen Wert. Mhm. Äh, damals hatten nur wenige Wissenschaftler in den Vereinigten Staaten <lacht> und Museen äh, die Gegenstände der Indianer gesammelt. Mhm. Und das war damals auch nicht restriktiv. Man durfte es nach Europa bringen. Und das hat Patty Frank ausgenutzt. Mhm. So René uh, tells us about that when the museum was, was opened in, on December 1st, 1928, it was a, it was a phenomenal uh, event that, that was well recognized locally and internationally. Because at that time, uh, there wasn't really that much research going on. Um, There's a little background noise, some people doing garden work here. So that's, it's just an unplugged show. This is our open air studio. So hopefully you can still hear us, <laughs> then it's okay. And this kind of unpluggedness is, is also what, uh, so one of the founders or main key figures was Petty Frank. And Petty Frank was, was really instrumental in, in also collecting. So this, uh, the museum is a museum and it has something to show. And these are real uh, artifacts from uh, all around America. And at that time, that was unmatched. Uh, actually, in America itself, the level of sort of research, uh, cultural and historical research, wasn't to the same level as it was here. So it was unique, unique in the world. And probably because here one was more removed, more distanced, there was a larger interest, like it is in many ways in life, when you know the grass is green on the other side, it's the same. So basically here, there was this uh, uh, raised awareness. And Petty Frank was sitting in this log hut in the yard of the, of the, uh, of the Villa Shetterhand, which is, by the way, the name of, of the building the museum is in. And, and, and old Shetterhand is one of the key figures, key players in uh, the um, in the Kalmai um, uh, uh, basically writings so um, so Rene is very nicely also critical about the the, the romanticism that goes with um, sort of looking at that 
at that sort of exotic culture that people were sort of, you know, their fantasy is all they were doing was sitting around the fire, holding their hands, singing songs. And he even says, even the log was sort of an interpretation, was a mystification of reality. It wasn't reality because, you know, the Wild West in the U.S. wasn't always fun. Mostly it wasn't, you even say, because it was the mere survival. I mean, they were kind of pioneering a country that had nothing. And it was it was tough. It was really tough. So you're critical about that. Some to a certain degree, this kind of uh, blurring of, of history of, of historical rea reality went with it. But the point is, is it's an interpretation. It's a reflection. So the museum is also uh, trying to make that clear. There are certain parts that are real. These are the artifacts, and they are of real value. And you also said in these days there wasn't protectionism. So actually, people were allowed to bring these things, whereas these days it's not the case anymore. And we have a current case, and we can talk a little bit that some uh, natives uh, basically said, we want that back. <laughs> that creates some discussion. But that's also true in other cultures, with the Egyptian culture, there's also similar kind of tendencies. So the museum and Rene makes, makes clear, and again, also his, his outfit is very classy. But he's, he's clear about that. He says, I'm not imitating. I'm not pretending to live in the past. I'm living here and now, but I'm demonstrating sort of an intellectual reflection of the values that we as another culture found interesting in, in that culture. So that's a very interesting kind of thing. Um, so um, what are your favorite parts sort of in to in these days I think when you when you look at the the festival for example um, I, I heard some people saying I said has this always been so many uh, sort of um, shows and so many villages that they build up there so how was that how did that get started way back and and how do you see the trend today and now that you're sort of a little bit more uh, uh, sort of distance to it yourself, maybe you can also take a critical view of where you could imagine it, it going or not. Also nochmal die Frage, wie also auch das Fest sozusagen, das war wahrscheinlich sehr viel bescheidener damals in den Anfängen und hat sich sehr viel mehr entwickelt, sicher auch dann durch die Öffnung ähm, und so auch verkommerzialisiert natürlich. Ja. Und wie, wie siehst du da sozusagen diese Tendenz auch gerne ein bisschen kritisch, da du jetzt auch ein bisschen freier reden kannst? Ja, also die, die, es ist immer noch die Faszination des Wilden Westens, also durch, begründet durch Filme, durch die Country-Musik, die wir schon erwähnt haben, aber auch durch die Literatur natürlich. Aber wir sind uns darüber im Klaren, es ist auch spürbar, dass in der heutigen Zeit ganz andere Medien mhm. mit da sind. Also zu meiner Zeit, in meiner Kindheit, die ich viel gelesen habe, gab es keinen Computer. Mhm. Da gab es kein äh, SMS oder irgend, äh, solche technischen Neuerungen. Äh, das muss man heute den, den Kindern schon sagen. Also Leute, es gab mal eine Zeit, da gab es keinen Fernseher. Da gab es dieses nicht. Und das hat auch Wirkung auf dieses Museum. Das, ähm, das spornt uns allerdings an, hier an den Originalen etwas zu zeigen. Also nicht irgendwo Hollywood oder irgendwo äh, aufbereitet äh, für die modernen Medien, sondern dass man sehen kann, das ist ein Pfeil und Bogen mhm. der Indianer. Also damit hat man mal Tiere gejagt, mhm, mh. was man sich vielleicht sonst nicht vorstellen kann. Und dass man an verschiedenen Stellen auch äh, die, die, die Fertigkeiten der, der Indianer nachempfinden kann, in dem Kinder basteln. Aha. Also es, es verschiebt <lacht> sich etwas äh, die Betrachtung. Mhm. Und äh, nicht alles, was sich da in der letzten Zeit getan hat, zum Beispiel eben die Kommerzialisierung, dass alles nur noch über das Geld gesehen wird, mhm, äh, ist gut. Mhm. Sondern es ist eigentlich Karmai vermittelt der Werte, mhm. ja, die, ja, die ich schon erwähnt habe, wie Tapferkeit, Freundschaft und äh, eigentlich auch Liebe zu den anderen Menschen mhm. also und, und auch Achtung mhm. ihrer Kultur und Religion, das geht ein bisschen unter. Mhm. Ja, das mhm. ist, äh, ja, die Kommerzialisierung hat ja, Janus mhm. mhm. So René uh, talks about, again, recalls that when he was young, when he got his access to Karl May, books were basically all there was. That was the most fancy device and there was no TV and you were almost making the gesture towards your <laughs> cell phone, which you own and I own. 
but we just got used to them more or less recently. So there was no such thing as, as these things. So he says, as an educational device for culture and then the youngest generation, the, which in, in Hawaii, the, the children are called keiki. So for the keiki, it's a very important thing, he says, to get them exposed to that history in, in, in sort of a real way. And not through uh, movies, which there are a lot about, you know, Western movies and cowboys and stuff like that. But to the real thing. So they can go into the museum and they can see there is a bow. This is how they were having to, they had to fight for their daily food. They couldn't go in a grocery store and buy. There was this immediacy. And, that, and, and, and so the society was, was working on a much different level. And he says, this is the real kind of... Um, value of the museum and especially also of the festival that actually um, him being critical about the trend and the tendency of, of, of commercialization, of capitalization, that everything has been done for, for the buck. And I know that, that Ali told me a similar story when she was working with the circus a while ago and she was sort of shocked how it was just about buy, buy, buy. So these parts you see critically and or as a challenge uh, to kind of deal with and, and work with that everything is, is, is driven by, by this capitalistic. Whereas the original values of Karl May were sort of about the opposite. It was about, it was about friendship, it was about relationships, it was about love, it was about loyalty, it was about trust, it was about faith and all these things so his Plato year is basically to kind of try to run the museum, obviously, which in these days, you know, business is involved, there are costs uh, associated. So all these have to be taken care of in a managerial way, there's no doubt. But you're really kind of advocating for kind of keeping and holding on and focusing on these true values, which could be of tremendous educational experience for the kids. I mean, for example, you know, I mean, my, my nephew, Julian, is a good example. You know, he's five years old. He has all the whistles and bells and, you know, he, he, he's on the phone more than we and he knows more about that than we, which doesn't say a lot speaking for myself. But this is a very special weekend for him where he feels this kind of unpluggedness. I mean, he's around, he's kind of the bad guys. You have some of the figures, you know, on the, on the festivals who are the bad guys. <laughs> And, and he, you know, he was very respectful of them first, you know, because they were the bad guys. And then he kind of reached out and, you know, started to talk to them. And now they're his friends. So he's a bad guy as well and likes that. And he's not a really bad guy. So, so I think this is a really, really great point you make that it's about, you know, learning from an ancient culture about qualities that me, we might want to rethink. We might want to reiterate. We might want to reinterpret for our own life and, and stepping back a little bit from what we have sort of created around us and sort of trying to rethink about maybe the roots or the, the real origin of our culture, which, which still is about that without social interaction, you know, nothing basically works. So, so that's an excellent point. So what's, what's your highlight of the, of the contemporary shows? You're still involved, you have many um, functions still, although you're not operating it anymore but you, you're involved more than ever and so what's what's your favorite part and and what are the things almost like you know sort of a little analogy to call my when he finally sort of slowed down with riding and actually was then traveling to the place that he visited which would be the now that you hopefully get a little bit more time which would be the places maybe connected to call my that you would like to see that you haven't seen also now, wo es diese Parallele gibt vielleicht zu Karl May, wo der sozusagen später dann etwas weniger geschrieben hat und dann auch mehr reisen konnte. Was sind so deine persönlichen Reiseziele, Träume oder Orte, die du noch ähm, sehen möchtest, jetzt wo du vielleicht ein bisschen mehr Zeit hast? Ich bin sehr historisch interessiert und äh, an manchen historischen Orten in den Vereinigten Staaten war ich schon. Also in Turmstorn, nicht? das ist ja so eine Legende, die... Äh, auch in Europa, äh, da brauchen wir bloß das Wort Tombstone sagen, da wissen die alle Bescheid. Mhm. Und äh, mich interessieren nochmal die, die Städten, wo der Bürgerkrieg stattgefunden hat, mhm. dort Gettysburg oder so, also diese historischen Städte, mhm. aber auch, äh, auch wenn man das schon einmal erlebt hat, den Grand Canyon. Mhm, das ist immer wieder eine Faszination. Aber man könnte jetzt schwärmen und viele Städte in den Vereinigten Staaten aufführen, 
auf Hawaii. Mhm. Wunderbar. Ich ärgere mich, dass ich damals äh, nicht in Deutschland äh, gebucht habe, der Flug zu den Nebeninseln. Mhm. Äh, ja, und das will ich nochmal nachholen. Mhm. Mhm. Das ist ganz sicher. Ja, und äh, natürlich auch andere Teile der Welt, wo mhm. Kulturgeschichte geschrieben wurde. Mhm. Mal die Pyramiden von Gizeh und die Akropolis. Mhm. Mhm. Aber auch, ja, da, in diesen Kulturen kenne ich mich weniger aus. Indien oder China, mhm, wo äh, Weltgeschichte geschrieben mhm. worden ist, wo Weltkulturstätten äh, sind. Mhm. Ja, das sind so Träume. Äh, wohl wissend, äh, dass nicht alle Träume im Leben in Erfüllung gehen. Ähm, da ist auch die Lebenszeit zu kurz und der Geldbeutel zu schmal. Mhm, und aus dieser Kombination heraus wird es sicher eine Auswahl geben, aber die mhm. Vereinigten Staaten sind ganz mhm. sicher. Mhm. Alaska reicht mhm. überhaupt. Aber wie gesagt, ich möchte jetzt nicht schwärmen, da könnte ich noch eine halbe Stunde erzählen. <lacht> yeah, René says there, there are many places that he would like to see. He's very open about cultures that he hasn't seen, which is India and China. But then more so the, the really the, the kind of cradles of, of, of world culture as, as the Egyptian culture, the, the pyramids of Gizeh. But foremost, he's, he's really um, interested to see more of American culture, um, uh, sp places where the Civil War started in, in Gettysburg. And, and the Grand Canyon just has a fascination. I was saying, we have the little Grand Canyon here. He also <laughs> said you wouldn't mind uh, seeing, seeing our Hawaiian canyons, which I just had the privilege to see the one on Kauai, which I was very, very blown away. And, that made you a little bit uh, sentimental because when you had the chance to uh, see Hawaii at that time uh, booking the, the inner island flights wasn't that easy so you basically mm -hmm. I shouldn't say because then people are really mad at me because it's about our Oahu and Honolulu but you basically got stuck there mm -hmm. and you didn't have the chance so hopefully you come back now you know more people so you're more than welcome <laughs> to connect to us and by the way there's a really interesting if you look at Hawaiian culture is also an interesting thing to, to compare, obviously, to the mainland, to here, and the interest of other cultures in other cultures. So that's a, that's a very interesting thing. You had been mentioning the, the, the sort of, the, the, sort of the, the default places that someone who's been interested in American culture and the Native American, that there are places they have to go. And you mentioned Tombstone. And um, I probably want to make that sort of my next sort of little reflection because as I said, the last time we have met, well, we met here every year, but the last time we, we spent a couple, you know, hours and actually day together was in Tombstone, Arizona, where you were uh, interested in, uh, in opening a little branch of your museum in, in Tombstone. And then we had this uh, sort of um, interesting... Um, situation that you got in touch with a gentleman from Bavaria, from Munich, who also talking uh, childhood dreams and, and boys dreams, was basically um, uh, uh, fulfilling himself that dream in, in becoming the developer of a little, of a little village that uh, was a little, we can call it hotel or motel, and he themed it around, uh, around Wild West. And he had us as guests, and we had a wonderful dinner there, and had some some very intriguing uh, 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 kind of um, uh, yeah talk and, and and discussions about. So so that's an interesting that over and over again, I think the more you know the the whole the the Kalmai uh, history gets passed on, it just resonates with people, and even to to a to a degree that a pretty much down to earth with both his feet on the ground businessman basically was saying, well, I'm I want to do that. I want to go to another country. I want to buy a piece of dirt. Let's face it, because this is out there in the dust. You just keep on going Main Street Tombstone, and just you know we couldn't even see the car. I couldn't see the car which you were driving in in front of me because it was so dusted. And eventually he basically, and he basically said again, most of his guests are, are German again, you know, German, uh, bu other business people who just, you know, uh, they could probably go anywhere in the world, you know, because they have the money, which we said for us normal people, you know, traveling will, even though you could do it theoretically, because there's no society that restricts you, but it's capitalism that restricts you because, you know, we only have limited resources to travel. So many, many Germans are still fascinated by this, 
by this dream as 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 americans we should also mention that vice versa uh, they want to see germany because they consider that to be the cradle of culture and everything is so old and relatively speaking it is and then they go to bavaria most likely and we should uh, getting closer to the end of the show so maybe we spend a couple of minutes talk about the state saxony that we had a little interesting spontaneous discussion about yesterday that but the stereotype for for americans to go is bavaria that's kind of what they consider to be germany and then they go to neuschwanstein mm -hmm. and neuschwanstein once again is an interpretation it is not old it's fairly young it has central heating at its time was like phenomenal innovation and it was the most modern you can get but it was once again sort of a romantic and you know reflection of of one of the last kings on on past culture on medieval culture and um, i always felt bad when i was still teaching in the midwest in lincoln nebraska i had a colleague of mine who was in the uh <coughs> marketing department um, and and advertisement and she was taking her students there and then she ran into me and so i happened to be then the architectural tour guide and i was i think i demystified a little bit when i said well this is basically the german excalibur relating to the to the hotel in vegas <laughs> yeah. which is as you know a little authentic in in sort of a you know a, a strict way of looking at it but it is authentic in terms of a reflection and, and an imagination of people. You know, you just got to make sure that you tell people about that it's not real. But once you have told them and told them what about is real, I think you're, you're okay. And you can help people sort of, you know, enjoying these kind of dreams. So yeah, vielleicht, ich um, glaube, wir haben ein paar Minuten noch, noch übrig, dass wir ein bisschen über Sachsen reden. Und jetzt dann unser Gespräch, das Sachsen war ja viel größer als, und auch Niedersachsen, ne? ich war ja mal, wie der Name schon sagt, Teil von Sachsen. Und ja, interessant eben dann sozusagen zum Abschluss ist ja dann, dass, wie gesagt, der Amerikaner eigentlich nach Bayern es zieht, als sozusagen das Ziel, wenn man Deutschland bucht, dann bucht man München und die Alpen und Neuschwanstein, aber dann an zweiter Stelle dann ja schon sozusagen dann auch Sachsen und, und, und Radebeul und das Karl-Mai-Museum. Das ist ja sozusagen dann auch wirklich eine Errungenschaft. Ne? Ja, ein bisschen ja. über Sachsen. Ja, die sächsische Geschichte ist natürlich unglaublich interessant. <lacht> die sächsischen Könige waren kunstinteressiert. Im Gegensatz zu Preußen, da gab es immer so die Reibereien. Die Preußen waren militärisch besser, aber die Sachsen haben das Geld eher investiert in in Kunst und Kultur, mhm. äh, was in der Geschichte auch dann zu manchen Niederlagen geführt hat, militärischen Niederlagen geführt hat. Das ist das eine. Das andere ist, es ist wunderschön, wenn man betrachtet, dass der Karl May, äh, um noch früher auf ihn zurückzukommen, wenn man die Sächsische Schweiz, also <lacht> eben diese kleine Gebirge da elbaufwärts, wenn man das äh, in der Dimension verzehnfacht, mhm. die Höhen und die Größen, mhm. dann ist man dem den, den Grand Canyon sehr nah. Mhm. Und so ist, entsteht auch Fantasie, dass man sich hineinträumt in, mhm. eine, in eine kleine Geschichte und die dann äh, mit der Fantasie dann äh, ausbaut. Und die Sachsen waren immer fantasievoll. Mhm. Eben der Zwinger oder all diese Dinge, äh, die die Amerikaner jetzt Gott sei Dank auch äh, erleben können, mhm. nachdem der Eiserne vorhin mhm. ist. Mhm. Ich meine, der, der Hang, da könnte man neidisch werden, der Hang zu, zu Bayern ist ja auch dadurch begründet, äh, dass äh, im Zuge des Zweiten Weltkrieges die Amerikaner in Bayern mhm, äh, gelandet mhm, waren und wir auch in russische ja, Wir ja, waren ja, ja. Äh, von den Russen hier besetzt. Und jetzt besteht aber die Möglichkeit, dass man sich gegenseitig kennenlernt. Die mhm. Sachsen, Bayern, also. Mhm. Übrigens hat Karl May auch über den Ludwig den Toten, diesen Märchenkönig, auch geschrieben. Mhm. Äh, das ist auch so eine, so eine Geschichte für sich. Mhm. Ähm, ja, also es gibt nur wenige äh, Persönlichkeiten des 19. Jahrhunderts, über die Karl May nicht mhm. zumindest erwähnt hat. Mhm. Ja, und äh, wenn man diese Fantasie hat, mhm und dann auch ein bisschen Wissensdurst hat, mhm, mh. dann versucht man der Realität auf die Spur zu kommen, mhm. sich damit zu beschäftigen mhm. und das dann wieder in spannende Geschichten. Mhm, mh. Ja, that, that's extremely interesting uh, what you just said. 
So keywords for me are kind of imagination and education through imagination is probably uh, 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 one of the key components of what you just said. So uh, he, he said, it's interesting to see how things really came together that maybe for a good reason, Bavaria, that one could be jealous of or envious of being sort of the primary tourist focal point of Americans coming to, to Europe or to Germany might also have to do with that the Bavaria was the zone that has been governed by the US. So we can also see commercialization, try to avoid to say propagandization, having been a key player, whereas Saxony, which you pointed out very eloquently, um, different than the Prussians, which again, Northern Germans, you know, uh, were, uh, they were, you know, the Prussians were leaders as far as military-wise and being strict and being aggressive, so to speak, <laughs> whereas the Saxons had, um, had an interesting culture. And the kings were, were dedicating or allocating a significant amount of their, of their resources in art and culture. So they're investing in buildings. Building culture was a big thing. They were building uh, museums. They were building parks. They were really investing in, in education, which wasn't always to their advantage. Caused a lot of friction, like caused a lot of criticism. Uh, but it's, but it's, it's a very rich uh, um, sort of a background and a culture that now after the wall came down, uh, René say so sort of really in the spirit of Karl May. So I think he's living in you by now after 28 years. I think, you know, you carry on the spirit of talking together and, uh, and sort of intercultural communication and the wall coming down and now sort of Bavarians can talk to Saxons and Saxons can talk to Bavarians and that all will eventually get to America. So Americans will find out, okay, there is more than we thought there is. So that's a really interesting thing. And you also said that comes back full circle to Karl May that he also wrote about Ludwig II, who was that king who built Neuschwanstein, was the client of Neuschwanstein. So a really, really, so you're, you're sort of your plot final, and again, kind of um, repeated plaidoyer is basically for being open, being, being eager, and everything comes from imagination and curiosity. So first of all, you're interested in something, you create an excitement about it. And once you start to get your, your mind going and you think, uh, you enjoy, and this enjoyment sort of fuels a further interest that becomes then solid education and learning about things and gathering data. And that's what Karl May basically did, right? He got excited about a topic and he did phenomenal research so even though he couldn't go there, but he went to the libraries, he talked to people. So he tried to get as close to the reality, yet knowing that it wasn't real. He, he was on a mission and the mission was humanity and he was a humanist and he wanted to talk about, uh, you know, societies uh, getting along with each other. So he was, he was a diplomat to that degree, right? Yeah, the Saxons were always fiffig wie wir hier sagen, und äh, viele Erfindungen mhm. des 19. Jahrhunderts wurden hier in Sachsen gemacht. Auch 20. Jahrhundert. Also der, der Kaffeefilter, ich meine, das ja. wird in Amerika auch bekannt sein. Oder der Wirkstoff vom Aspirin, mhm. der ist hier in Sachsen erfunden mhm. worden mhm. und mhm. Hat, war weltweit bekannt. Ne? Und da könnte man noch weitere äh, Dinge aufzählen. Mit anderen Worten, die ja, sind fantasiebegabt und sind auch begabt, die Fantasie dann in uh, um uh, Ne points out that maybe another similarity between, we could probably say this is more all encompassing indigenous cultures who in all places in the world had been very inventive. They had to make something out of nothing, make diamonds out of dirt is another way of saying it. This is the steam train, by the way, in the distance again, if we can listen to that. And he says that's something that's, that the Saxons are known for and have been known for. And for example, interesting also for America, the coffee filter by Melita is, is, a, is, an, is an invention out of, out of Saxony. And the other example he said was... Um, oh, the aspirin, or which I guess is probably Tylenol also as a product in America. But that sort of main essence has been invented here and in many other things. So. It's a very innovative, and actually today, these days, there's a lot of uh, industry, uh, high-tech industry, sort of, it's almost like some call, the area around Dresden, 
the kind of the Silicon Valley of, of Germany. So there's a lot of high tech, innovative uh, business and industry basically choosing Saxony probably because of this kind of inventive, imaginative spirit that to a certain degree, you know, how I lived. And again, I shouldn't forget that you were talking about the the area around Dresden, which there is a there is a there is a there is a mountain area that we call the uh, the, the Saxonian Swiss Switzerland, so to speak. And it's I used the term bonsai before, and he <laughs> smiled. It's yeah. basically sort of a miniature version of what we come back to imagination, what one could imagine to be the Grand Canyon. But it comes, you know, it isn't, it is smaller, but there are certain features that are reminiscent and it takes the imagination to make them as big as the ones one dreams of. Diese, diese Hang, dass wir auch viele Erfindungen gemacht haben, mm -hmm. das ist unsere Form von Pioniergeist, mm -hmm. der mm -hmm. sächsische Form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ja. So uh, René says that the, uh, this kind of uh, basically skill or talent for inventing things is, is sort of the, the, the Saxonian uh, um, equivalent to the, to the pioneering. So instead of going out and physically moving on, you guys went creatively on and moved on and in your mind imagined things and created them and created the beautiful culture and, and, and quality of life in, in your state of Saxony. So I think with that we're close to the to the end. Uh, Rene, thank you very much for thank taking you. your time, uh, for the friendship and for your leadership of the museum, which is a very important cultural institution. And keep up the great work, be involved, but also you know try to fulfill as many of these dreams that you shared with us. So, well, thank you for this, the möglichkeit Sachsen darzustellen und etwas zu kommen zu sagen. Viele Grüße nach Hamburg. All right. René, uh, thanks you guys uh, for having the chance to talk about Hawaii, about uh, Karl May, and he greets everyone back in good old Hawaii. So thank you very much. See you next week. <laughs>